but but before we get to well well maybe on the way to get to that or in the process of getting to that i want to also ask you about some of these others that you you reference that you say you you build from because um as i said earlier today i i, I you know i'm I admit there's a there's a there's a personal selfish bent to this line that I'm, of questioning I want to or this question that I want to or this question through which I want to draw a line from today's discussion with you to one we're going to have Friday with with uh, Palestinian human rights law lawyer, lawyer Nora Erakat because oh yeah that's great in, in a discussion with her it it it, it pre, pre, you know privately it, it and we're, we are going to talk about some of this publicly some it came to my attention that an interview I did with Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs and Dr. Haidt a few years ago, some years ago on radio with Frank Wilderson has been reprinted and translated and used. And I think um, it led to some misunderstandings in terms of what I mean and maybe what Frank means. I, I can't speak for him. I don't even, I, I can't even claim to understand what afro pessimism and I can't even claim to understand it in its totality. So I'm not, I'm not speaking on it. I'm just saying, I think there's some misunderstandings. So I wanted, I see that you reference Wilderson and you do, you make reference to, to, to social death and ontological uh, positioning and, and his work. So I'm just curious to what extent does Afro pessimism fold into your work? And, 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 and then I have a couple of questions about how you interpret it, given what has been um, coming to my attention more and more lately, yeah. some of the criticism of Afro pessimism. Yeah over the years. So I'm, I'm just yeah, curious right what you're doing with it. Yeah. Well, 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 you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing is that every emergent kind of school of thought always has roots, almost always has roots in not only prior streams of radical thought, I'm talking about radical streams of thought, right? It not only has roots in prior radical and revolutionary and liberation streams of thought, but usually has some kind of indebtedness to movements, right? Collective movements, collective accountabilities. That's that's where the tension is. And I'm not picking. I'm not saying this is unique to what people call Afro pessimism. I'm saying this is this is part of the inherent tension. Sometimes irreconcilable. Sometimes not irreconcilable. Sometimes this shit can get worked out, right? But this is part of the inherent tension with 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 radical and revolutionary academic and scholarly work. Uh, is is is. And I want to phrase, I want to think about this broadly. So I'm not, again, I'm not, I don't want to think about this as unique to, to what people call for pessimism. I want to think in this particular historical moment, um, in the most robust ways about what it means for a particular body of radical thought to be accountable to some kind of a collective that is beyond itself, right? That is beyond itself. Because the, here's the thing is, um, a good friend of mine, well, there's more than one good friend of mine, but there's one good friend of mine named, named Nick Mitchell who teaches at UC Santa Cruz, right? And, and um, we had, you know, he, he talks about this, we had a conversation about it recently. Part of the problem I think we run into when, when we have scholarship as our day job <laughs> and we, you know, and, 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 and publishing this kind of specialized work for particular audiences becomes part of the way we get paid um, is we get lulled into this, um, we get lulled into this practice where the work of critique, the work of theorization becomes an end within itself, right? And, and, here's, what, and here's what becomes frustrating and dangerous about that is um, because, because we like to be smart, I should say we really like to be smart asses, right? But like really sophisticated smart asses is we come up with these layers of um, justification as to why it is that it's cool to just sit within these kind of closed circles of theorization and critique and and think about that as the end, right? As the end. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that is the responsibility that people like you and me have to the world, right? To the people, to the collectives, to the movements. Um, Right, and, and, and to the traditions that we say we are accountable, like that we say we're part of it, we're part of it, we gotta be accountable to that, right? So that's just, that's, that means to say then that um, Afro-pessimism, you know, black, black radical, the black radical tradition, um, black feminism, abolitionist feminism, um, different forms of anti-colonial thought, 
I, I borrow and rely so heavily on these different streams of theorization and analysis, right? So, so Afro pessimism is no different for no different than that. And, and again, like I, I was in dialogue with with um, with Frank Wilson throughout my graduate school life. We were in grad school at the same time at the same institution. So um, I love Frank, you know, I do. And I think that there that there's parts of the analysis and the critique of Afro pessimism that draw from a longer tradition of Black radicalism that are that are totally vital and that I think fuel. Uh, a radical understanding and actually like a kind of a kind of antagonistic irreconcilable understanding of what civilization is civilization with capital C like I deeply appreciate that I think that is deeply important um what what concerns me this is not again this is not unique to African pessimism this, this is about academic thought what concerns me is how it is that the people who inherit these modes of critique theoretical analysis and um and pedagogy because it also becomes a form of teaching right how, how does that stuff um, incite forms of collective praxis, which might not be devoutly loyal to the school of thought, right? In fact, they might even rub up against that school of thought, rub up, rub up against the kind of critiques even of that school of thought, but which are willing to get into the dirt, that are willing to inhabit forms of contradiction, that are willing to be accountable to collectives, communities of people that extend beyond that particular circle of critique. Right. Um, that's, I think, the tension with a lot of academic circles, um, especially, especially people who identify, especially people who identify as academics, which I think we should actively try not to do. <laughs> right. Because academia, this is what I've been saying over and over again. Academia is not actually a place. It's not a building somewhere. It's it's an it's an ambition. It's an aspiration. And it's not a good one. Right. You know, you want to talk about what white being is. White being is inseparable from the thing we call academia. So I think there's actually a need to actively disidentify with modes of teaching, thinking and writing that are simply academic. I'm not saying that we don't engage in in in, in dense and layered analysis and writing all the time. I think that's part of that's part of these revolutionary radical traditions. We do that. Right. But say that what we what the, the way we operationalize this work can't fall back into the loop of counterinsurgency. Right. And that's 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 the takeaway point. Right. My concern is with how it is that different forms of purportedly radical revolutionary academic thought fall back into the loop of counterinsurgency in the sense that they actually they, they actually filter people away from collective forms of struggle against institutionalized and normalized forms of violence, anti-blackness, colonialism, etc. Because uh, the loop says that that being engaged in these forms of critique and analysis is in and of itself already the end. I think that is not something to be happy with. So, so again, I, I look, first of all, I want to say to you and everyone else, I, I'm constantly, well, I shouldn't, that's not the right word. I am um, um, I routinely often attempting or in some sort of, um, you know, delayed email exchange with, with Frank. So I'm constantly asking him to come back. Um, and I, you know, and we haven't worked that out yet. So, uh, um, but that is what if to the extent I understand what you just said, this is the part that is always where I either find myself confused and we don't have I don't want us to stay here. But but, you know, but this is but it is still very much, I think, related to your book, um, at least anyway. I, I am not I have never read Frank's work or, in, or understood him in his interviews with me. Uh, and I've not read his new I've not read Afro pessimism and I've not read. um extensively beyond, I think, a little bit of Red, White, and Black. I've read Incognigros, the only full-length, the only book I've read all the way through of his. But in our interviews, I never get, I never walk away with this idea that he's he's discouraging. Not at all. Never. Okay, look but, Frank, but, but, but even what I heard you just say, what I heard you saying that he, that his work is part of what encourages but, but the lack of practice yeah. and engagement. But go ahead. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Yeah, go yeah ahead. no, no. This, this. So, so what? So let me let me put a finer point on this. And this is not unique to anybody. This, I'm not. This is not mm -hmm. singling Frank out at all. This is this mm -hmm. is part of work that circulates in academic circles. The the, the challenge is how, with how that shit circulates, how it gets inherited, and whether or not it gets purpose to other kinds of things, right? And 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 what you see all the time with different forms of academic thought or stuff that circulates as academic thought. Is 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 it becomes the school becomes the school in and of itself, right? And and this is not something that 
the people who are generating the work for that school would ever encourage that they will tell you they will tell you all day that that is not what they want what they what they what they want to see is something they want the revolution. impact is something else you're saying yeah it's the way this stuff gets circled and that's the that's what that's part so of that is group. actually to your point so so and 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 this is what Nora and I are going to at least start our conversation with on Friday uh because Part of an interview I was involved with with Frank has been clipped and recirculated in which he says something to the effect that because of the rampant anti-blackness in the histories of Arabs and even Palestinians, once black people help Palestinians get liberated, and he said we should, we're then going to have to jack them up too, I think was the phrase that that, that is upsetting. That in yeah. other words, to say that we have to deal with them too. Now, and in the interview, I'm agreeing with him. And I'm reading it on the text and I'm saying, wow, that does read is harsh, but I'm also reading that I'm agreeing with him. And what I heard him saying, what I think I was hearing him say, I didn't ever heard it. I, and, you know, so my point is, I never took that to mean we're going to go to war with the Palestinians. I thought it, I took it to mean that there's going to have to be another level of conversations after they get liberated because there is anti-blackness in Arab communities yeah. and Palestinian communities yeah. as Suhair Ahmed and other Afro-Palestinians continue yeah. to remind us of that. So I'm not, so my, so, so but when I, so, Anyway, so I wanted to ask you specifically because as someone who comes, uh, uh, quote unquote, outside the black community who writes about anti-blackness yeah. and black radical traditions, or as Dr. CBS keeps checking me, traditions of radical blackness. Yeah. When, so that when I saw you engaging Wilderson, I didn't, I, I don't know, I didn't see, you, you don't, you know, center his work, but I just saw him mention, I wanted to know, so are you then interpreting his work to mean that there can't be black Asian solidarity or black Latino no, solidarity I, or black. What I see, what I see, what yeah, I see Frank's work doing among other, among many other people, right? So, so I want to get off that too. I think, I think Frank would would say this, but, but I think um, there's a tendency to kind of valorize individuals, like you actually introduce us this way, right? Um, uh, the, the the show this way. There's a tend tendency to valorize and fixate on individuals because they're fucking brilliant people and shit. Like you know, what I mean, there's like a good reason for that to happen, but but I think it's also unhealthy. Mm. Right, I think it's unhealthy, and I think it becomes ahistorical in the sense that we start to attribute um, certain analysis, certain politics, certain ideas to individuals rather than to a stream of work, right? A stream of labor, much of which is generated by people who are not writing books necessarily, who might be, who might be, you know, singing songs, writing poetry. I mean, whatever, right? Or or, or just speaking, speaking to it in the context of of a movement struggle. Um, what what I'll say what I'll say is so important about the work that Frank and others are doing is it they're naming anti-blackness as a perpetual condition of warfare. It, this is my interpretation. Of I was going to say that's definitely how you use it, and I, and I appreciate your your application yeah. of it absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, go yeah. So the ontological level, meaning the coming into being, right, the negation of, of of black being, like that is central to the way the war is formulated. Way, but but I'm also concerned with a certain register of anti-blackness as perpetual warfare. So naming that, mm -hmm. right, which is which is something that long precedes the, the emergence of Afro-pessimism as a school of thought, right? But 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 Afro-pessimism Afro has a kind of brilliant way of, of stating it, of framing it. Identifying anti-blackness as a perpetual state of war that is not unique to white people, all right, but is actually something that proliferates and toxifies multiple peoples, multiple moves, including other so-called oppressed peoples, is a vital analysis, a vital form of politics. And what it does is it actually, that analysis of anti-blackness as perpetual toxifying proliferating warfare that is inherited by different peoples, well beyond colonizing and enslaving white people, um, is a vital kind of ingredient of any attempt to engage in coalition and solidarity and in, for frankly, in, 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 in liberationist struggle, including counter war. Right, whatever we call counter war, we think about guerrilla war in a really serious way. Then we're talking not just about armed struggle; we're talking about um, warfare at the level of ideology, of ideas, of commitment, of aesthetics, um, of community, and so forth. So, actually, what I think is 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 the thing that gets sometimes marginalized or left behind, or preemptively dismissed, maybe even trivialized or caricatured, is is the fact that uh, a, a radical understanding of anti-blackness as as warfare can actually be something that constitutes solidarity rather than preempts or makes it impossible, right? It makes it harder. No shit, right? No shit. It makes it harder. It may, it mean, it means that there's a kind of insistence 
on addressing that dynamic all the fucking time, right? But but to the contrary, it should not be the thing that prevents people from doing that work. All right. And again, and again, I understand and I honor the critique that, you know, in so many of those instances, it is the black folks in the coalition or in the solidarity movement who are constantly paying the fucking price, right? Of deal coming face to face with the anti-blackness. And like that's why I understand why it is that sometimes that shit's just not gonna work, right? Sometimes sometimes people just gotta walk away from it. But I also think if the force of the critique of anti-blackness is is to be taken seriously, and I think and, and it clearly is, because it's now it's now everywhere, right? People are changing their language. They're no longer using necessarily the word of just racism or colonialism. They're using the language of anti-blackness. All right. I, I was gonna say, I see this, I see this even in um, I shouldn't say even, I see this in this this recent you know, group of Filipino, Filipino American activists that I um, just got invited into that's doing work around the police killing of Angelo Quinto up in Antioch in Northern California, right? There's a, there's a kind of incipient emerging language around the specificity of anti-blackness and policing that is kind of making its way into this coalition where shit, man, five, 10 years ago, it, no, nowhere would it have been there. The farthest you would have gotten would have been racism, would have been racist police violence. So um, my point is if we're taking this the force of the of the of the analysis and the language and the critique of anti-blackness seriously, then I think that there's not just a possibility, there's an obligation to have that forceful critique, that forceful analysis be part of what constitutes um movements, communities. And you know, solidarity coalition is one form of that, but I'm just thinking about different efforts that people are making to generate um grassroots community that is that is ground that is grounded or kind of um, um a learning from Black radical, black revolutionary, and black liberationist traditions, including queer, trans, and feminist, not including centrally at this moment, centrally queer, trans, and feminist traditions. Um, so that's, but but I think I think that's the tension. Because, because there's a certain way that radical critiques of what is can can be inherited by people or kind of consumed by people in a really fucked up neoliberal way as, as a product. Right, as a product, and not and not as a way to kind of trouble what they do. It just becomes ah shit. I can't, I can't, I can't fuck with you all. Right, the anti-blackness of that peer, of that thing over there. I can't. And by the way, I see this happening especially with non-black people of color, who will do this and then not so, and then not get engaged. Right, not get engaged and not bring the force of the critique to to that particular movement and struggle. So you know, I mean, I see this with the cops off campus campaign, which I'm which I'm also proudly part of. That's emerged in the last you know. Um, in the last year or so, um, it's a police abolition campaign, and and there's there's a real tension there as well. But it's 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 up, it's been highly productive, right? It's about try, kind of producing an abolitionist struggle to actually eliminate police presence with a specific understanding of of what anti black police terror actually means on college and university campuses. Um, so I think that's where the that's where the possibility is. Um, I just want people to embrace that more because that shit is messy. All right, it's not formulaic. It's not comforting. It's pro it, it, it can be profoundly antagonistic, right? And some people are gonna not like each other. Some people are gonna not gonna like the critique. But I, I'm saying, you know, you look at you look at at the, again, you look at the history of movements that have actually succeeded in overthrowing oppressive regimes. They were fucking messy. They were messy. They were misogynist. They were sexist, right? They were colonial, right? They were anti-black in these different ways. So there's no way to get at this kind of pristine modality of being engaged in collective struggle. But my point is that the force of the critique should be constituting what we do, not 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 something that preempts an attempt to do something together with each other. I hope right, that so, makes sense, man. I hope that I, makes sense. I don't sense. know. I, listen, I, I, it, it, I don't know that you're not making sense. I'll, I just don't know that I fully understand and I may not fully agree, but I don't I don't know. I honestly, I, I just don't know at this moment. So I, I but, we but think about it more. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, definitely. We, we'll keep rapping, you know.